Hi everyone, we're coming to you live from Bourbon, Colombia today, one of our season sponsors. And welcome to our second Masterworks concert of the season uh, with the theme Prokofiev's Piano. So in the, the centerpiece of this program features Piano Concerto Number no. 3 by Sergei Prokofiev. And it features our 2021 Arthur Fraser International Piano Competition winner, Solomon Gah, playing this incredibly virtuosic showpiece for piano and orchestra. Uh, surrounding the Prokofiev, we feature two works. Uh, in the second half, you will hear the uh, very infectious, uh, dance-like and romantic Symphony No. 8 by Antonin Dvorak. And before the Prokofiev to open the concert, you will hear dramatic work by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, called Ballad for Orchestra. These two works by Coleridge Taylor and Dvorak share a similar trait uh, in a way. You will hear some influences of Dvorak's music in Coleridge Taylor's work. He was, uh, Dvorak was one of Coleridge Taylor's musical inspirations. Uh, also, there is a, a similar story behind the, these two composers. We now know Dvorak as, as a, one of the famous composers uh, in classical music who wrote, of course, the famous Ninth Symphony from the New World, uh, works like Cello Concerto uh, or Slavonic Dances and so on. But he had a late start before he was recognized uh, as a composer. Uh, he was trained as a violist, so he played, uh, he played uh, in these opera orchestras, uh, he, had, uh, he had sort of a teaching gigs while, while trying to establish himself uh, as a composer, but he was not really being successful at first. But it was uh, somebody who suggested that, well, why don't you send one of your, or a few of your scores to Johannes Brahms. And Brahms was somebody that Dvorak uh, admired as a composer. So Dvorak took up on that uh, advice and sent several of his uh, pieces to, to Brahms. So Brahms, uh, upon receiving Dvorak's scores, uh, went through them and really fell in love with Dvorak's style, uh, where he combined uh, the romantic music traditions, but sort of infused it with music music, the ideas, uh, the subject matters of Dvorak's native Bohemia. And so what Brahms did was he took these scores and then he referred these scores or to, uh, Dvorak to his own publisher, Simrock. And back then in the uh, last part of the uh, later half of the uh, 19th century, having a publisher, a major publisher as Brahms's publisher, Simrock, uh, meant a huge deal for aspiring composers. So that was the break that Dvorak needed uh, to start gaining recognition as a composer uh, worldwide. Uh, obviously in Europe, uh, he, became, he became a huge uh, popular composer in London, in England. And of course then he, uh, as a result of those successes, he was invited to spend two years, uh, two years uh, teaching at the National Conservatory, the new National Conservatory of Music uh, here in the United States and spent a few, uh, few years in New York City. Uh, famously went to Spillville, Iowa because he got homesick and he learned that there was a huge um, sort of uh, Czech uh, immigrant population in that part of Iowa. So he traveled there, got the inspirations for works like the From the New World, uh, the Ninth Symphony, or the famous String Quartet, the American uh, String Quartet. So Brahms played a huge role in Dvorak's success, sort of as a mentor, but also opening, opening doors, opening opportunities. Coleridge Taylor, uh, whose father was a physician from Sierra Leone, but was trained in England. His mother was English, and he grew up in England. Uh, he was taught piano lessons, violin lessons, was interested in compositions from, from, from fairly early on. So his break, uh, sort of his career uh, break, in a way, huge break for Coleridge Taylor came with this piece that you're about to hear this weekend, Ballad in A Minor for Orchestra, which he wrote uh, in 1898, 1898, when he was 23 years uh, old. 
he got a commission from, uh, through, it was another senior composer. In this case, it was Edward Elgar of the pomp and circumstance fame, uh, Enigma variations, and so on. It was Elgar's publisher uh, who worked for a publishing company that still exists called uh, Novello. Uh, the, the name of the, the publisher was Andreas Jaeger. Uh, those of you who are huge fans of uh, Elgar's uh, Enigma variations, probably the most famous of those variations called Nimrod, which is uh, often featured uh, in, in it is sort of excerpted on, the, on its own. It's such a heartfelt, uh, gorgeous movement. Well, Elgar dedicated that Nimrod variation to, to Jaeger, to Andreas Jaeger, who was uh, he was a very good friend of Elgar's, uh, personally and professionally. Uh, apparently, Jaeger was very encouraging to Elgar when he himself was sort of facing certain sort of crisis in a way uh, as a struggling composer. Jaeger believed in Elgar's talent uh, as a composer, so Elgar was forever thankful for that uh, for that friendship and, and trust, and so. It was, it was the Elgar and Jaeger connection that actually Jaeger wanted to commission Elgar a, a short piece to be featured at this annual music festival during the summer, but Elgar was too busy. So he said, well, I know this younger composer, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, you should ask him to compose something. So that's how this piece uh, that you're about to hear tonight, Ballading A Minor, came about. And it was a huge success. He was also commissioned to write a cantata for chorus and orchestra about a couple months later, which, be, which was even a bigger success. So that's how his compositional career uh, was launched. Uh, and it kind of shows the importance in a way, right, of, of, of mentorship. Uh, these two examples, Brahms and his publisher on one hand, uh, Elgar and his publisher, on the other hand, sort of helping to nurture and launch the careers of these younger composers. And that's, you know, that's still true today when we think about the, the, the different performers, uh, conductors, composers, uh, there's the mentor-mentee relationship is, is, is critical uh, in, in many instances to, to launch su successful careers. And so we have two examples of that from, from 19th century. Uh, in, this, in this program. Coleridge Taylor's work is called Ballade, and uh, it's, it's, um, when we spell it, of course, uh, there's an E at the end, but if you take that E off, it, it looks like ballad. And for many of us, ballad sounds like some kind of a, a romantic sounding song, maybe, uh, you know, uh, singing about romantic subject matters and so on. But ballad, as a as a genre was actually quite popular, uh, especially those of you who are fans of uh, Chopin's piano music, for instance, he wrote a series of pieces called Ballade, uh, not associated with any particular plot, but it unfolds like a, some kind of a mini miniature drama in a way with contrasting themes, contrasting moods uh, that builds up. And so it's not necessarily always soft and um, soft and easy uh, sounding uh, music as might you, one might associate with when you hear the term ballad. Uh, ballad is slightly different. And so Coleridge Taylor, what he did was he essentially was inspired by that miniature form that Chopin used. And when you think of Chopin's piano ballads uh, as well, uh, they, they last a little, about 10 to 12 minutes long. So it's, it's longer than, let's say, a very short overture, uh, which typically lasts six to seven minutes. And it's definitely shorter than a multi-movement symphony, like the Dvorak symphony you hear. So it's sort of the medium length. Uh, some people call them like tone poems. You think of works like Smetana's Moldau, of course, those famous symphonic poems by Richard Strauss that comes later. Uh, uh, later uh, in the proceedings, uh, Coleridge Taylor takes sort of the same idea, but he creates this miniature that lasts about 12 to 13 minutes. And without any specific plot, although you're welcome to imagine one, uh, using contrasting moods and contrasting musical themes uh, creates this musical narrative. 
And so that's the, what we'll open the concert with. At the end of the concert, of course, I mentioned Dvorak and his eighth symphony. The symphony number eight, though not as famous as the ninth symphony, the famous New World Symphony from, from the New World, uh, the eighth symphony is where Dvorak really taps into his bohemian soul, uh, in a way. In his earlier symphonies, you see Dvorak at times trying to fully immerse himself in the musical traditions of composers like Brahms, for instance, who obviously he admired, or Wagner, and tries to become more, more German, more Austrian in his writing. Some of his other works, he tries to embrace fully sort of the bohemian uh, using, using folk dance rhythms, uh, sort of the subject matters of the, the Czech folklores and so on, and going pieces like his Slavonic dances, for instance, which comes from earlier in his career, are examples of those. Uh, in the A Symphony, I, I feel like those two ideas is the perfect balance of the two. So while it unfolds in a, a perfect four movement symphony, the musically it is, it is just filled with, with the, these uh, very unique uh, bohemian uh, folk dance rhythms, uh, sort of the folk song ideas, even though he did not actually quote any, any folk songs, these are all, all original uh, melodies by Dvorak, but to me it's the perfect fusion uh, of the two. And probably that's why, these, this, that's why this piece uh, has become such a, a popular uh, staple in our repertoire. Another reason I think that our, how listeners and performers alike uh, have, been, have been in love with this piece is the huge contrast. Even though the piece, he calls it Symphony Number no. 8 in G major, even in the first movement there's a huge contrast between the major section and the, 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 the darker, much darker minor modes. And it's that huge contrast that he sets up, uh, he sets up a huge sections of G minor section with this dark sound uh, using middle and low instruments of the orchestra to sort of sets up then uh, the brilliant contrast of this blazing G major conclusion at the end of the movement and so on. Uh, even in the second movement, which is a slow movement, it has a, a huge peaks and valleys uh, throughout, both in terms of the volume and how many instruments he uses. Uh, you will hear uh, glorious trumpet fanfare uh, in the midst of this slow movement in the second movement. But then second movement also has this almost like sounds like a little, little peasant, uh, like a little, little village band uh, playing this very easygoing theme. Uh, some people think that it's, it sounds like Adam's family, uh, it, it, parts of it. Uh, but then it also features beautiful, uh, very beautiful soaring violin solos, bird songs in the flutes and so on. So it's just such a, almost like, almost like a miniature, like a portrait of, of bohemian life uh, in the second movement. The third movement, whereas many composers, Beethoven was famous for scherzos, in his, uh, in his third movements of his, his symphonies. Dvorak here uses, it's basically a waltz. And so you hear this uh, very easy sound, easy going uh, waltz as the main idea uh, of, of this movement. This is probably the movement where it sounds in a way most bohemian and most folk-like uh, throughout. And then the last movement opens again with the trumpet fanfare but then it, um, it starts to become a sort of a theme in variation, uh, in a way. Again, using different solo instruments. Uh, flute has a huge uh, solo in this movement. Um, and then it just builds to a huge conclusion. But then again, just like in the first movement, there are moments of, of, of beautiful contrast from all the celebra celebratory uh, music of the glorious celebration of the fourth movement, there are moments of, of, of reflection and, and repose, uh, sort of this melancholy uh, moments uh, throughout the movement as well to set up, set up this huge contrast that I think uh, become, has become a part of the big appeal uh, to listeners and performers alike uh, for this piece.
And between these two pieces, to end the first half of the program, we have the third piano concerto by Sergei Prokofiev, which he wrote in 1921. And this was when an uh, interesting uh, time in his career and his life. Uh, of course, he left Russia initially uh, and spent a lot of time in Paris, spent some time in the US as well. Eventually, he moved back with his, his, with his family to, of course, what was then a Soviet Union in the, in the late 1930s and where he remained for the rest of his life. Uh, this was sort of the traveling part of Prokofi Prokofiev's life, and both as a pianist and as, as a composer. Uh, he, was, he was well known in, in the earlier part of his career. He was perhaps better known as a pianist than he was, he was a composer, actually. And this piano concerto was written before he moved to Paris. Uh, he spent a lot of time in, uh, on the coast of Brittany in, in, in France, where there were a lot of Russian immigrants there. So he had a few friends that he knew from back home in Russia. So he decided to spend some time uh, in Brittany. And this was, of course, uh, became a sort of a hotbed for artists. Uh, people like uh, Picasso and Matisse, uh, they spent some time in Brittany as well. Uh, there were famous writers, musicians, of course, like Prokofiev. And this is where uh, he decided to compose his third piano concerto. He has five piano concertos, and this is perhaps the most, most performed and most famous one uh, today, partly because of its technical demands it makes on the soloist. Uh, it's often used as sort of a, a technical, sort of a showpiece, virtuoso calling card. Uh, for pianists uh, around the world. And so it's uh, our pleasure to welcome Solomon Gaw, who is our uh, guest artist for this concert. And as I mentioned, uh, he won the Arthur Fraser International Piano Competition uh, last year with this piece. So I'm looking forward to welcoming him to Colombia, to, to our, to our uh, musical family, and uh, showcase his dazzling technique and musicianship. Uh, throughout this, this, this concerto. The concerto is written in three movements and uh, it starts out very innocent and, and, and uh, simple with, with, with the clarinet stating one of the main themes over a very soft accompaniment. But then soon the soloist enters with flurry of scales and running uh, fast 16th notes and off, off we go to the first movement. First movement it's probably most excerpted of the three movements. Uh, when we have piano competitions, for instance, a lot of the times the young pianists will play just the first movement uh, of this concerto because in a way it has everything. It has, it has very nimble, fast uh, technical passage work, but then at the same time it requires the soloist to play with such force and power uh, to to battle out with the full orchestra. And it also has moments of very delicate uh, phrase work in the middle as well. So it, it has, you can showcase essentially what you got as a, as a young pianist within the course of this 10 minute movement. And as in a way Prokofiev is showing off his, his sort of, you know, his skills as a composer in a way uh, uh, as well. Uh, in just in this first movement, that's, again, it's it's got it's got everything for for the soloist, but then the orchestra, at times, as I mentioned, is essentially battling it out with with the soloist. So it's it's not one of those concertos where uh, where the soloist takes most of the interesting materials and then we are accompanying, uh, but this concerto where there are times where the orchestra is really the equal partner uh, with the, with the soloist. Uh, the second movement is a theme in variations uh, as, as, a, as a basically that's the a, a basic premise of this movement. So there's a simple theme that is stated and what follows is a series of five variations. Uh, and again, when we, come to, when we think of things like theme in variations, the contrast becomes the key. So in some of the variations, uh, you will hear again this uh, the amazing um, the technique work, the virtuosity of the of the soloist and some of the instruments in the orchestra as well, 
and then in some of the variations, you, you will hear the more, more, um, more reflective and more lyrical side uh, of, the, of, the, of the soloist uh, as well as the orchestra. And so it's, it's again, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful movement that uh, sort of transports both the, the listeners and, not, and, and performers alike uh, using the same theme by but by transforming that theme in creative ways, Prokofiev was uh, Prokofiev managed to uh, manages to do that. The last movement, uh, I've always felt the last movement is in a way is a bit ironic uh, because the marking at the beginning of the movement, he says fast but not too fast. But I feel like towards the end of the movement, it is a, just a race to the finish between the pianist uh, and the orchestra. It is such, a, such an exciting finish. Um, of course, in, uh, to me, it feels like it does, it does get really fast. Uh, that's why I always felt it was ironic that he, he marked that as in, it's fast, but not too fast. Uh, but that's just at the beginning. And of course, through the course of the movement, um, you, uh, you know, the things kind of pick up pace as, uh, uh, dramatically and musically uh, in terms of the tempo as well. So it's, uh, it goes to a brilliant conclusion, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great showpiece, uh, not only of the technical aspect of a soloist, but also of the, the musical depth and different colors that the soloist can get out of the piano uh, and sort of the, the, the lyrical playing uh, how one interacts with the orchestra and various uh, sections of the orchestra, and so on. So it's got it's got it's got it all. It's one of the uh, one of the one of the best uh, piano concertos from from the 20th century, and I know you're going to enjoy that. So this concert has two works from the late 19th century, sort of the height of the Romantic era, uh, with lots of drama, lots of passion, uh, lots of beautiful melodies but with the full power of the uh, full orchestra uh, in the Coleridge Taylor and the Dvorak, and you have this dazzling, uh, just sensational uh, piano concerto from the early 20th century. So I hope you enjoy a second Masterworks concert of the season, Prokofiev's Piano. <laughs>